Hello and welcome to the Raptor Show on the Sports Night Radio Network, presented by Campbell's new chunky spicy soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. And please rate and review the show. I'm your host, Wayne Lou. I'm joined by co-host Blake Murphy in studio. This is what we got for you today. Segment one, we're going to talk about that riveting Raptors win over the Bulls yesterday. I'm actually fired up still from the game. Raptors winning last night, 118 to 107. A friend of the program, Savannah Hamilton, did indeed get that walk-off interview. We manifested that one on the show <laughs> Gary yesterday. didn't give her much, though. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you got to pick your moments. You got to pick the right guys. But still, I mean, you know, Gary sometimes can get a good quote. Um you know, but yeah, big, big win. That's going to be segment one. Segment two, we're going to check in with uh, Tim Bontemps. You know, Joel B gets hurt. Was he playing through injury just so they can meet the 65 game mark? Very unfortunate for him how his injury is going to go. Uh, and just look at the, you know, the Knicks, look at the, the, you know, just the Atlantic division. That's what, uh, that's what Bontemps is there for. It's uh, when Toronto's included and he spends some time in Canada, it's Tim Bontemps. Yes, you, you that's give right. it the French pronunciation, but uh, the bad. Raptors are not relevant. The Raptors are not relevant in the Atlantic Division. Uh, still sitting on zero and eleven, but hey, at least they beat the uh, they beat beat the Bulls. I was gonna say I have not seen uh, Tim Bonton in, uh, in 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 Canada this year. There has been no Tom. I have not seen any national media in Canada this year. Why would you? You know what? Now that you mention it, didn't even see Zach Lowe over Christmas. No, uh, Raptors didn't play at home very much over Christmas. Uh-huh. So that's uh, that's a possibility. Yeah. There, but yeah, we've had we've had very little. I don't think Damn. we've seen. I don't think we've seen Bontemps. Uh, I don't think we've seen, like, Sam Amick. Yeah. Uh, just nobody. Really. Definitely no Woj, no Shams. Like, Shams has been on our show. That's the closest he's been to yeah. the Raptors, at least in, in Toronto. Uh, yeah. Well, damn. Yo, it's... Oh, yo, yo, when you start losing, it's really bad. Anyway, so... There's, with, like, <laughs> there are industry factors in media not traveling as much, and then yeah. there are... You went, you're 17 and 30, but you beat the Bulls factors uh-huh. in, in not traveling national media. Uh... Yeah, well, segment three, we got, we're got we going to bring in Katie Heindel, friend of the program. She's going to join us in studio. We're going to talk about Bruce Brown, who had a great game last night. Uh, just talk about, you know, the patience and a rebuild. Marc Gasol officially retired. Yeah. Um, hung up his uh, sneakers as the president, but also, like, the star player of Hirona. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll reminisce over Marc Gasol's career. And then segment four, we're going to go around the NBA, you and I, and just look at a couple of topics. Yeah, but, a lot uh, of stuff last night. A very eventful night in the NBA, but the game that you needed to watch was Raptors Bulls. Uh, like I mentioned, Raptors winning one eighteen to one hundred seven. My big takeaway from the game was just I'm happy we had some vets around because the <laughs> vets really stepped up and, and helped a lot. I thought Bruce Brown, uh, Dennis Schroeder, Thad Young all gave some good effort. What did you see from the veterans last night? Yeah, Bruce Brown's best game as a Raptor, other than maybe his debut, where you know we were kind of uh, evaluating it with. Uh, you know, with a curve because he got there like a couple hours before the game. Um, but yeah, I thought he was really good. I thought his second half was tremendous, like easily right. the, the best second half he played. He basically was the stabilizing force in the third quarter when the Raptors were trying to first keep the game from getting out of hand and, and then to start the comeback there. So some nice stabilizing stuff from Bruce Brown. You see in how that third quarter played out why most contending teams around the NBA are probably calling the Raptors and seeing how they could get Bruce Brown to their second units at the trade deadline. I I think, you know, there had been some, nobody after three or four games was going to be like, Bruce Brown was overrated. He's not that good, but he had a couple of rough games. He he didn't really quite fit. He was slippery hands for a couple of games there and stuff. Uh, I think you saw it last night. Um, Dennis Schroeder, Again, doing a good job coming between these roles. A little little heavy on the turnovers last night. And, And, you know, again, there were little windows where late in the game it's like okay you know settle down a little bit but for the most part he's been very very good Mm -hmm. moving back and forth between these roles to me the headline item was Thad Young once again being a really big contributor so he finished with 16 6 and 6 he is 35 years old like I don't want to I don't want to make it seem like a 35 year old can't play in the NBA like LeBron James exists Uh, this is a this is a, a thing but over the team's first 36 games this year he had played only once, really, outside of garbage time. Yeah, He had only played more than five minutes once in a game over those first 36. He hasn't played fewer than 12 minutes in the uh, the 11 games since. So this has been a big change. This wasn't Thad was injured and is healthy now. This is Thad wasn't in the plans. Jakob Pertl was there, so they had the center, and they had to call on him. And no, it's not particularly flashy, but the amount of 
being in the right place at the right time, knowing the timing and angles of your cuts when mm -hmm. Scotty draws extra attention, say, being able to make that one extra connector pass, you know, so much of the stuff where we see, you know, we're used to seeing it with Jakob in the high post at that kind of elbow extended and Thad there because he has a little bit more juice as a dribbler, um, able to make some plays out of that position to kind of connect to the second side of the floor and yeah. also to the strong side shooter. Just a really nice connection connection passer there. Um, yeah, it's and, and mostly like, look, this is stuff that Thad Young, when he first got to Toronto, it was a breath of fresh air. It was like, wow, there's, there's someone in there who can kind of fill in these little gaps. And then last year, whenever they called on him, it was like, oh yeah, there's an adult in the room. Mm -hmm. Like there's someone to settle things down. And, and you're just seeing more of that. It's been really, really cool. Whether it lasts, whether it should actually be happening when you're rebuilding or whatever. Um, it's been so cool to see 11 games of throwback Thad uh, as someone who has for a very long time been a huge Thad Young fan and wanted him on the Raptors years before he reached the twilight part of his career. It's just been really, really cool. Yeah, I, I think it's just a testament to his professionalism. Like, again, like you mentioned, he's not featured for the entire year until Jakob's injury, and now he's starting a bunch of games. I mean, his first his start was like, hey, Jakob's out because he twisted his ankle um, jumping for a rebound with Pascal or jumping for an entry pass with Pascal Siakam. Uh, how about you start tonight against LeBron James and Anthony Davis? How, how about that? And the next night, guess what? Back to back, you're playing uh, Zubac and Kawhi That's and Paul George and James Harden. Oh, yeah. Zubac was in that one. And then Zubac wasn't in the second one. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, and, and he stepped in and he's immediately done well. I mean, you always hear about them talking about the stay ready games where the third unit guys who don't feature much get in playing time against like literally assistant coaches, right? The assistant coaches who, you know, credit to them. Some of them maybe could be balling, but like we're talking about NBA players playing against assistant coaches. He went from that to jumping right in and, and looking really steady. Like um, I think there are obviously limitations to his game in terms of, you know, I don't think the Raptors are particularly defensively solid with that young playing center, but I don't know, man, you're also asking a guy who's never really played center in his career to step in out of the blue, and then just go up there against these seven-footers. I appreciate the fact that he's doing his very best. He is uh, doing the dirty work. And then offensively, I mean, Thad's always been a solid offensive player. Um, and, yeah, you see it right now. So Thad's shooting, what, 57% from the field? 59. 59% from the field. Yeah, like that's outside of Jakob, which is pretty much impossible to shoot Jakob's, like, league-leading 68% from the field. He's been really efficient, too, with his offense, not taking a bunch of shots. And as you mentioned, the passing, so... I'll, I'll, I, I'll do credit to Thad Young, man. I have Ultimate a cra crazy Thad Young stat for you, especially okay, let's, considering let's... he didn't play anything but garbage time for the first 36 games right, of the season. Hit me. At the start of the season, I gave you and Alex a bunch of fake prop bets. Mm -hmm. And the over-under I set on Thad Young minutes at center was 230 and a half. That is how many minutes he played just at center last year. Okay. Um, so, like, obviously you're factoring in, okay, he may play some of his minutes at the four. Yeah. Um, he's not going to have a big role in this team. He's blown it away already. Oh, yeah. He's played 277 minutes this year, and I think all but, like, five of them have been as the center. Damn. Yeah, and I think our and Basically, that's in 11 games. Yeah, I think our calculation at the time was, like, okay, so obviously Jakob's going to play most of the season. Mm -hmm. and obviously, when Jakob's there, Thad's minutes really get cut. And Precious was there at the time. Precious was there. And then you wanted to see a lot of small ball center with Scotty as well. Mm -hmm. um, we Honestly, at that point, we weren't even sure Christian was going to factor in or not. Yeah. Obviously, he hasn't factored in this season. But... Um, yeah, no, credit to Thad, credit to the veterans. I thought they were all really good. Leading scorer last night, Gary Trent Jr., uh, making six threes uh, for 24 points with the Raptors. Um, I think to me, what was nice to see was all six threes were catch-and-shoot threes, and he was confident with it. He was aggressive with it. Him shooting six of 11 from three, which is what he did last night, is a great number, of course, And you know, um, but it's also not that uncommon. I looked up the splits. Gary's shooting 52% from three in 12 starts this season compared to 37% from three kind of off the bench. I don't know if he'll hold up for that much longer, but 52% from three over a 12 game stretch. So, is you impressive. know, this is like a thing that bugs me, right? Oh, I know. That's why I'm bringing this up. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Uh, I pulled the numbers the other day for the entire league yep, yep. of all the players who start and all the players who. Uh, come off the bench and let me uh, let me find it in the sheets here. Mm -hmm. um, apologies for this. I should have had this ready, but I didn't know we were getting there. Yeah. Um, so basically what I did is I pulled all the numbers for starters in the league and bench players in the league. So bench bench players in the NBA shoot 35.5% on threes. Mm -hmm. Starters shoot 37.4%. Okay. That makes sense. Start Better players start. 
So they're better sure. shooters. Yep. Um, but then I isolated just the guy, the guys who have played both roles, the guys who have started mm -hmm. and come off the bench. So those fringy guys, yeah. those role specific guys, and they shoot thirty five point three percent coming off the bench and thirty six point seven percent starting. So okay. that's not a huge difference. But when you're talking about like over ten thousand three point attempts in each sample, it's it's pretty significant mm -hmm. given the the number of guys who swing their roles around. So it is not, you know, Gary's is obviously an extreme going from 37 to 52%. Yep. Um, one of the things that I would like to see within that, in that like sub sample split is um, does he catch and shoot more as a starter mm -hmm. versus creating more for himself off the bench? Because we also know he's shooting 46% on catch and shoot threes. Right. And, but only 31% on pull-ups and, and he should probably just not be taking very many pull-ups anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that changed anyway, league wide, this is not a Gary specific thing. You get elevated to the starting lineup. You're playing with better players. You get defensive attention. You probably get more catch and shoot threes that are a little more open than you do off the bench. Mm -hmm. Not a surprise, although that doesn't that isn't to discredit Gary because you're hitting forty six percent on catch and shoot threes on the season. Yeah, buddy, I don't care what your role is. Keep keep shooting them. It's funny because it doesn't really feel like Gary's having some sort of overwhelming season, and he definitely isn't. You know, to be clear, but there are still certain aspects where it's like when he's actually hitting from three it fills in such a big gap for the team. And, I mean, I, I guess my bigger question is just why is it that putting aside, you know, maybe just general trends and general factors specific to Gary, why do you think Gary specifically performs much better as a starter than as a uh, second unit guy? Yeah, I think it's because in the second unit, I'd have to dig the numbers up to make sure that this is backed up statistically. But the way it feels like is when he's a starter, he's asked to play a very narrow role offensively, and that suits him. It's come off a lot of pin downs, and yeah, you've got those situations where you can one dribble into a floater, and there's the space for that, but because you're then on the floor with Scotty Barnes and or Pascal Siakam before the trade, um, you have a natural point guard setting you up, whereas a lot of those bench units earlier in the year didn't include a natural point guard. There's just, right. there's just and look, some of it is honestly randomness, but I also think that, um, like, I mean, just look at the way that, and this is the thing where the the two hands wash each other, where Gary comes in and this spacing that he provides helps everyone else out a lot. Mm -hmm. But also because of who he's playing with, he then is getting more open space than he would off the bench. So I think it's it's really just a spacing component where like he's more open and, and he's having those shots set up for him. And again, I'd have to dig into the numbers of the assisted percentage of, of his threes and stuff like that to make sure the, the numbers are backing up the eye test. But my feel is just like he gets easier shots, more in the flow of the rhythm, playing with better players. And he would not be the first, you know, Gary's not a shooting specialist, but he would not be the first like pseudo shooting specialist who can really only thrive with like good players to set them up. Well, I think my thing is just like, especially in some of these recent games, he's not necessarily playing with better players with the starting five. I mean, like guys are kind of in and out anyway. Um, I mean, so, he was playing with like, no, like I mean, he's not, playing, he's not sure. playing with Malachi Flynn and Jalen McDaniels and, and Precious at you anymore. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. like Precious is a good player who's playing well with the Knicks, but he's not a guy who is going to he was help not a good you manipulate Toronto space. In, in and, yeah. yeah. No, I get it. But I, I do think that like there might be another component that might be missing in this, which is just like when you start, you, you feel like you have more rope, you know, like you're not just going to get yanked for missing a shot here or there. I do feel like Gary maybe gets in a better rhythm when he starts, and maybe plays with more confidence. I can understand that confidence. You know, he makes more. Shots. So I can understand that, but my issue with that argument has always been that like that is probably true for ninety percent of bench players in the yeah, NBA. Yeah. So even though it's true, like a lot of people will use that as you have to start Gary because, mm -hmm. which I don't think is fair. I think yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. I think Gary succeeds starting because is a fine explanation yeah. but like if you're going to make that as an argument like when he's coming off the bench and not playing well mm. if that's the argument for promoting him that hey he's playing poorly so he should get a better opportunity yeah, yeah. that's where it kind of falls apart for me because i, I think that. it's true for a lot of guys no i get that and that was a conversation we had a lot at the start of the season for example like who should we start you yeah. know where the Raptors is going to start for example with scotty as a as a as a big point guard and then dennis comes off the bench and then gary starts with them for more spacing we had the discussions at the start of the year at this point i mean i don't think that that's in the long-term cards in the future for gary to be like a starting point guard with toronto on a consistent basis but it is interesting to me because i think for him specifically he would help his value so much if he can bring this type of production on both roles then all of a sudden it's so much easier for him to fit with so many different teams mm -hmm. the way we talk about bruce brown bruce brown can walk into any team tomorrow go into rotation and be productive Right? He's literally showing that right now with the Raptors. 
I think if Gary can do that too, it's just like so few teams are going to bend over or just like change everything just to accommodate like, you know, the fourth or fifth guy on the yeah. team. And so I think for Gary, he needs to find that level of consistency as well. But he was great at, for the starting unit. It was great to have reserves coming off the bench who can also make threes. Jordan Wara, by the way, I was specifically told by Raptors PR, the N is silent. Okay, so it's Wara. I know. That's how I've been saying it. Oh, okay. Sorry. I just keep saying Nawara because it sounds so cool. But No, it's uh, it's Wara. Like, just Wara. All right. Well, Jordan Wara uh, came off the bench, 17 points, four or five from three. Um, what would you see from him? Because he had another you know strong performance uh, off the bench. Yeah. Point. I mean, I thought he got off to uh, an iffy start in this one, even though the, the shooting was there. Like, yeah, you knocked down a couple threes. And like we talked about yesterday, mm. you're six foot eight and you can shoot. There's going to be oh, yeah. opportunity for you in an, an NBA rotation, but particularly this NBA rotation. Um, but I thought as the game progressed, he got a little bit more comfortable in some of the more scripted stuff that they were doing for him. Okay. Like, like they were letting him run the Gary playbook a little bit oh, yeah, where yeah. he's coming off of pin downs on the second side. You kind of catch. And then, like I said with Gary, you have that option of like, okay, you could get into your floater package if you want. Jordan Warwick doesn't really do that. He, he instead was like, I got to catch a body. Uh, it it didn't quite work out that way, but he tried, man. Uh -huh. yeah. um, that was really cool. It was nice to see. I, I know you're kind of fascinated by like, man, he doesn't look like he's that kind of athlete. And then he has this burst to the yeah, rim like yeah. that. Um, so I, I thought it was good. I thought it was a nice progression off of the last game where, you know, he didn't do any passing in this one really, mm -hmm. but being able to showcase a couple, at least like two layers to the scoring. You know, we talk about scoring and kind of, four level scoring now or, or you know because you've got the rim and then the, the second box as your <laughs> as your boy box. david thorpe likes um but kind of rim floater range <laughs> yeah, mid-range yeah, long yeah. range like he's got the three-point shot and now if you can show a little bit of a nose for the rim uh -huh. um at least against you know because look even if he's putting up 24 one game and 17 yeah. the next game if the raptors are remotely healthy jordan war is low on the scouting report he's pretty open on that weak side wing mm. where when he catches the ball, if he's decisive off the catch, he's going to have a defender kind of scrambling back out to him late, maybe a little off balance. You're going to have those opportunities to drive. It's actually a spot where despite the struggles this year, Precious Achua was always really effective was like, Hey, if you can tilt the floor this way and then swing me the ball, I can use the space. Yeah. You just got to create the space for me. So right. uh, it was nice to see an instance or two of that as well. What did you see from him? No, I, I just like the fact that we have another player off the bench that we can run, like, movement shooter sets for, mm -hmm. right, which is essentially what happened. I mean, I think long-term, you would like to see Grady in that role, or Grady's also done a bit of it, too. But, yeah, Jordan's come in, and it, it's refreshing to have not just one shooter off the bench, but two. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that, that missed dunk was exhilarating for, for what it was. And as, as someone did point out, uh, Drummond was also involved in that play because some people made the comparisons to James Johnson. Yeah. Infamously back in the day, what he did to Andre Cock Drummond. that joint back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, Drummond just being there 10 years later, kind of maybe some flashbacks, maybe yeah. even more than 10 years later now at this point. But um, he's solid. I, I continue to want to see more minutes from him. I think defensively, that's where Darko said, like, we want to see more out of him. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I did see him with that with that block, at the, you know, which kind of forced like a shot clock violation right there afterwards. So yep. that was a good stop. He also had the crossover snatch back for the 4.3. That, yeah. was, that was really nice. Um, was it but, Julian Phillips that fouled him? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was not familiar with this game until I saw him yesterday. I'm not going to lie. He fouled Julian Phillips on the corner three, yes. right? Yeah, Where yeah, did yeah, that did. play there, there yeah. was a play, I think in the first half, where like, the Bulls didn't even run anything. They just swung the ball twice, and Julian Phillips was wide open for a corner three. Like, mm -hmm. it, they hadn't even gotten into their set yet, really. I think it was Wara that fouled him, but then yeah. he got him back with it, yeah. Yeah, but what would you make of his defense? Because that's where kind of Darko's looking for. Yeah, so. I'm still not there with it, I think. Okay, you know, what's the main issue, then? Is there a weakness? I, well, the the main issue is that for four years, he just hasn't been that good a defender. Like, Okay, like, okay. But I don't I mean, a lot be, of young guys are like that. Yeah, I so, that. I mean, look, there's there's an element to this of you're in a new scheme and stuff like that. Yeah. But he's never been a guy who is going to like a thousand percent, keep his man in front of him. Okay. He has a little bit of, again, to make the Gary comparison, even though they're, they're different players and different mm -hmm. sizes, a little bit of the, my idea of good defense is trying to do, trying to do a lot. Yeah. So it's, it's not necessarily stopping your guy and keeping him away from the ball. It's like, I'm going to gamble for this steal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, Hey, today I'm a little foul prone. Cause I'm, I'm trying to make it happen. Um, like, I don't think it's like, hey, he falls asleep and gets back cut a lot. I think it's just finding the right level of uh, aggression there, I guess, versus, you know, when you tell a guy, when you're making mistakes of aggression, mm -hmm. it's hard not to get passive in response. It's sure. hard to dial it down a little bit. Um, so there's some of that. Some guys just aren't 
that good defensively either. Like, yeah. I, I don't think he has the best, like, like to get into, like, the scout talk. Like, I don't think he has the best, like, hip fluidity, like, moving laterally and then yeah, changing okay. his angle and stuff like that. So if he is put on an island one-on-one -on -one against a guy who's quicker than him, I don't really trust his ability to kind of, you know, do anything other than kind of hopefully angle them toward the help. And obviously right now, that's not something you can really do without Jakob Pertl back there. Yeah. Maybe it'll look a little better with Pertl. Um, This is kind of similar to... And this is a crazy comparison because obviously this guy's on the further end of, of being good defensively. But like Matisse Thybul mm -hmm. is an elite defender when there are there's a key point of attack guy defending over here and yep. a key rim protector over here. Yep. I think War could be a solid defender in a system like that where he doesn't have to guard the best guy and he can guide someone toward rim protection. But mm -hmm. left one-on-one -on -one without those things, I don't know. We haven't seen it in, in four years. So obviously something worth tracking. Yep. It's... Him coming from Indiana and not being particularly good defensively is not surprising. I mean, Him having gotten rotation minutes under Budenholzer in Milwaukee for two years and not being all that capable defensively is a little surprising in retrospect. Yeah, I think I just need to watch more of him, to yeah. be honest, because uh, I'm not necessarily seeing, like, him being a bad defender right now in Toronto. Like, maybe there are certain moments, for sure, but it's not, like, egregious. Like, I mean, I don't know, man. Look, look, look we just saw DeMar, for example. Like, I, I remember what DeMar was like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like we I mean, have to cover for him constantly. Brady Dick is on the floor, right? Like, yeah, we can yeah, point exactly. that example out where, like, now that he's back in the rotation, every sure. time down the floor, teams are funneling the ball to whoever mm -hmm. is on Grady. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not doing that to Jordan Wara. And some of that is size. And, hey, the, at a bare minimum, when you're six foot eight, if you yeah. can use your size, yeah. that's a good starting point. So but I do need to watch more because the yeah. more you see of the guy, especially you need to see defensive habits, you definitely need to just watch him yeah. for an extended run of games. Solid start, though. Offensive game, uh, offensively, he's a plus. That's why I'm asking about the defense, because mm -hmm. if he can also just be a defensive neutral, all of a sudden he's a rotation piece, and if he's a plus on both sides of the ball, if he gets to that point, then you can maybe even talk about him I mean, as a you know, a, a long-term piece or a future start or anything like that. I'd settle for defensive neutral. I just Trust me, that's as the next a bench step. guy, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about Darko, but that's less interesting. I'm going to ask you about Scotty. So, uh, mm -hmm. Scotty last night didn't really shoot the ball efficiently. Four of 14 from the field. Five turnovers. It had some pretty good assists, too, and, yeah, and some I great defensive plays. I love the playmaking part of his game, man. Okay. The, the creativity there, and, like, as we flesh out more of the system and there's a little bit more shooting, there aren't a ton of great cutters right now, but the way he picks out Thad Young, the way he looks for Bruce Brown, mm -hmm. just even with five turnovers in a game like that, yeah. I came away from that one so encouraged that the type of passes he even thinks to make and, and the reads mm -hmm. he can see one, as guys learn to play off of Scotty more and as they hopefully long term bring in better cutters and, and more shooting around him, I'm just I'm I'm really excited to what it, it's gonna look like where you know you go back to rookie Scotty and so much of the playmaking chops was like transition. Mm -hmm. It's like okay, he can read the floor so well in transition, he moves well, he makes these good passes, but it wasn't quite there in the half court yet. And then it was there a little bit more in the half court last year, but not really in pick and roll situations that much. And now it's just, I don't know, man, each extra responsibility you give to Scotty, the playmaking creativity is there at every single new thing you layer in. And then I would assume the playmaking effectiveness will come right. with more and more reps. But I love the creativity. I, I love the type of passes he's always trying to make. And him and Thad Young with this little chemistry is uh, that was nice. pretty fun. Because the Raptors were struggling for offense late in the game. And it was that combination there that got the Raptors a couple of baskets. What was the game? It was, was it the Grizzlies game too, where like their entire late game offense was Scotty dumping off the Thad? Yeah. Well, there was also another one where Bruce Brown was screening for Scotty. That mm -hmm. was the last time the Raptors played the Bulls. They lost in in in, uh, in Scotiabank. But um, my my pro for what I saw from Scotty last night was just the defensive effort has mm -hmm. been consistently high. Um, and then you saw the surprise double teams at DeMar DeRozan. And I thought that was a good call by Darko to throw those super aggressive traps. You know, because they were doubling DeMar when he got into the mid-range kind of area, uh, you know, but they, like, just blitzed him mm -hmm. at certain stretches, and they caught him by surprise, and DeMar threw a couple lazy passes. A lot of that was because of the pressure Scotty was putting on the ball. He got that steal. Just a couple of those moments to really push the Raptors ahead in the fourth quarter. His defense of his effort, again, like, uh, he's he's carrying the biggest load defensively pretty much for the whole team, and so to see him have that extra little burst of energy to also 
commit himself fully on defense at the end there was good. And, and the Raptors did a good job outside of just DeMar. And I know DeMar finished with 25 points and he got the free throw line. Yeah, it wasn't really on him, though. I'm not gonna no, lie. But, yeah. but DeMar did have five turnovers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if we had a stat for how many times a player made a play that ate up four or five seconds off the opponent's shot clock, yeah. I'd imagine Scotty last night would have been one of the better games you can yeah. you can imagine. And then around that, they did a pretty good job on Kobe White, uh, which yeah, they hadn't they really done did. last time. Like, that let Io Dusunmu get, get going a little bit. But, like, Io Dusunmu was shooting eight of 11 and four mm-hmm. or five on threes. You live with that uh, a lot. I thought overall last night was, like, one of the best defensive games the Raptors have played with Yakubo. Maybe the best defensive game they played yeah. with Yakubo. They took care of the boards, too, yeah. which was, again, like, you want to see a response, right? So, even though you're losing, you still want to maintain good habits. So, Darko talks so much about after the Hawks game, okay, we gave up 20 offensive rebounds. We gave up a game-winning putback. Let's make sure we work on boxing out. Well, what I want to see next game is you hold the Bulls to six offensive rebounds, mm-hmm. even though you're undersized at center, especially with Jonte Porter leaving the game with back spasms. The, I, I want to look at the other side, too, because I think for me, the cons were the five turnovers. Now, mm-hmm. those were not as much of a big deal to me when you watch back on the film. Yeah. Five is obviously a bad number. You want to cut that down. But you break it down. It's like two bad passes to cutters where I think he was actually leading them in the right direction. The, just the passes weren't really... Yeah. Um, you know, read by the cutter. There was one travel. Uh, there was one offensive goal de- goaltending on his own <laughs> shot, which isn't really even a turnover. It's a missed field goal to me. Yeah, and then one where he got double teamed late in the game, and then he had yeah. whatever. So that that's you know that, that that's the only one where it's like you got to read the double team a little bit better, especially when you're trying to attack and uh, you know end a game offense when you're trying to create uh, against the whole defense. My my thing from yesterday to watch was he really struggled to score one on one against Caruso. Caruso did a really good job guarding him. Just a couple of highlighted plays. One time, Scotty was trying to post up Caruso in the post. Caruso pulled the chair on him. That's how Scotty ended up with that travel. There was another play where, uh, you know, the Raptors were running a side pick and roll there. A guy cut back door, and uh, Caruso read that pass and picked off the play. That Mm -hmm. was to start the second half. There was an off-balance mid-range jumper that was heavily contested that Scotty was forced into. Two pull-up contested threes that Caruso pressured him into. And then a post-up where Scotty couldn't get two feet into the paint and had to settle for a long hook. This is the challenge now because you now get the Alex Caruso of every team on you yeah. with a second layer of help. But in this case, the Bulls actually mostly did it with just Caruso. And that's where I think he's going to need to learn more and more like craft and scoring moves in addition to the reads and the passing to get himself to be more effective because that to me, that was the big lesson for him in this mm-hmm. game. How do you play better against Caruso? And one one of the things that I find encouraging within that, at least from a process perspective, is look at how many different ways of scoring you just identified that Scotty tried against Caruso. Yeah. He had a lot of different things he could go to. Now, not none of it was super effective other than the the passing side of things. Mm-hmm. But I do think it's good that he didn't, you know, hey, I took him into the post and I couldn't get that mismatch, so I'm done. Yeah. It's no, I'm gonna he okay. Kept, he kept I'll, trying. I'll try it. I'll try to get it in my mid range bag. I'll do this post up more at the not even a post up, but like kind of I'll, I'll get to the elbow and try for try to get myself open for one of these push shots instead of going deep into the post. Mm-hmm. I'll try the pull up three, which you know his three point shooting's quietly uh, dipped yeah. off, uh, dipped off a little bit here, which is something to monitor as the season goes on. Possibly just random, possibly legs this late in the season or whatever, yeah. but. Um, you know, he'll that obviously that highlights why he needs that as a weapon long term and why it was so encouraging to see it earlier in the year. Um, yeah, there are going to be nights like this, man. Mm-hmm. There's a reason like 20 teams are calling the Bulls every day on oh, Alex yeah. Russo. He's he's real good at that. And uh, yeah, plays much bigger than his six five. Yeah, I honestly it's it frustrates me Dude, to see him. The Bulls, every time. the Bulls start DeMar DeRozan, Nikola Vucevic and Kobe White right now. And usually Zach Levine is in there, too. Yeah. And they're an above average defense. And I yeah. don't know how to explain it to you other than Alex Caruso. No, it, it is. And and once they get rid of him eventually, which doesn't seem to be soon anytime, by the way, Darnell Mayberry of The Athletic actually reported that the Bulls are clinging to and perhaps overvaluing their most attractive asset, Alex Caruso. And that within a week remaining of the NBA trade deadline, few within or around the Chicago Bulls organization anticipate the franchise making a major move. So it seems like the Bulls are just going to stay as is, kind of, you know, what confirming what Trey was talking about on yesterday's show. But um, still, I get it, though. I get it. Like, he is he is a game changer defensively. But, you know, that's the challenge now. You have to say to these type of players, and it'll be good to track how his uh, progress is. By the way, I have to mention that he also did have some pretty amazing dunks against Caruso last year as well. So yeah. it's not like this is the only time, but it's it's good to highlight the, tr- the, the changes. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to bring in Tim Bontemps uh, on the other side of this break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. 
Welcome back to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Will Lou, joined by co-host Blake Murphy, and we are joined on the line by Tim Bonton. Uh, come on, Savat, so Tim Bonton. Hello, Will. How are we doing? I don't know. <laughs> I just randomly decided to tell you, you know, how are you in French? Um, I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. Yeah, Raptors, I, my, uh... name, my name means words in French, but I don't know French, so... Well, Will was just in Montreal think. where he goes like once a month now and he doesn't know any French either. So uh, uh, that's the exciter. Yeah. Chris I Boucher I and I'll handle the French part of uh, the show as necessary. Tim, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Even as an honorary Canadian being from Buffalo, I have never been to Montreal. It's a place I got to check off my list at some point. You do. So you're from Buffalo. So you're all about this Jordan Wara breakout for uh, for the Raptors here. Another another Buffalo it's native, huge. as we've learned. Right. Yeah, This has got to be it. For, right. like, like the bills are done obviously so mm-hmm. you you guys just gotta it's it's jordan wara time in buffalo now just gotta shift just gotta shift to, to jordan probably could probably could use jordan's uh aggressiveness with with the bills sometimes wow <laughs> um okay let's uh let's let's talk about the east the rest of the eastern conference or the rest of the atlantic division because the raptors unfortunately um you know not not as uh not as interesting but uh, they, yeah. they got to get one win against an Atlantic Division team before right. Tim Bontemps well, Raptors, writes about yeah, them. Yeah, the Raptors, the Raptors will be interesting to see uh, <laughs> what they do over the next uh-huh. eight or nine days as opposed to their chances of doing something beyond that, unfortunately. Wow. Stay tuned to the Raptors show until the trade deadline. Afterwards, <laughs> it, it, you know, do it at your own Well, there, listen, own there'll, peril. Be, there'll be stuff to watch. We can talk about that later, but that that's yeah. going to be the interesting thing over the next eight days for sure. Okay, so the big thing, the biggest thing they be right now is how is Joel Embiid going to be, right? Because we saw him um, last night, the, Raptors, uh, the Sixers were playing, uh, the Warriors. Joel has missed the last two games. Obviously, the Jokic one was, like, much talked about so much, but you saw him actually yep. suit up, and he just didn't look right the whole game. And then at the middle of the fourth quarter, Sixers down, like, 14, pretty much, like, not a big chance to come back. And there was a loose ball. Kaminga ends up diving and, and landing on Embiid's leg. And it's not a malicious play. It's just going for a rebound. But you could immediately tell that Joel was hurt. And, um, yeah, I mean, I just – honestly, where are we at with this whole situation? And, and how much do you think it's linked to the idea that Joel wants to make sure he's available for the 65-game mark and also because so much of the national discussion was about Joel potentially ducking Jokic? Well, I was at the game Saturday, and Joel, as he did after he scored 70 points on Monday, another game I was at against the Spurs, um, had a really large wrap on his knee. The knee has been bothering him for months now. I mean, he missed three or four games earlier this month with the same issue. Um, so I, I don't think that this necessarily had anything to do with the 65-game rule. I mean, I think – at this point, I think he's sort of resigned himself to not playing enough games to qualify for it anyway. He's already won MVP. He would obviously like to win more, but his focus is more than anything on finally having a healthy full playoff run, something he's never had, and something he's talked to me about personally a lot, that every year he's had some kind of fluke injury in the playoffs. Last year, Cam Johnson fell into his leg in the first round, accidentally messed his knee up. He got obviously an incidental elbow from Pascal in the face the year before. He messed up his thumb in that series. He got hit in the face by Markel Fultz once and missed a bunch of time, right? Like he's had all these weird fluky plays that have kept him from having a full healthy playoff run at any point in his career. And so I think for him and the Sixers, the goal is to get to that end of the season, have him ready to go and be ready to play in the playoffs. I was not there the last couple of days. My guess is, you know, I thought there was some chance Joel could play in one of these two games of this back-to-back. And the Sixers had lost three in a row. They were without Tyrese Maxey. They were without Nick Batum. I think it was like, hey, let's try to get a win here against a struggling Warriors team and start to turn this around a little bit. And, you know, obviously, you know, the the injury at the end was not great. He didn't look great moving around in the game like he didn't in the loss to Indiana a few days ago um, leading into the Denver game. My hope is that the way he got fell on, it seemed like he more just banged it or hyperextended it than like he twisted it or anything because he was just laying on the ground. So I'm hoping that it just sort of exacerbated how he was already feeling and it's not too bad. And we'll see what the MRI results are going to be. But 
at this point, I just hope that we see Joel healthy in a couple months when the playoffs start, because I think as basketball fans, that's what we all would really like to see is him have a chance to go through one of these playoff runs fully healthy and see what that finally looks like. And I think that that's true, whether you really want to see Joel Embiid succeed and you would like to see someone who can drop 70 in a game healthy in the playoffs, or if you want to see the Sixers not succeed so that they could stop having the, well, Embiid wasn't 100% healthy uh, thing. You you would like them to lose fully on merit uh, as well, though, as they mostly did in 2019. This is Marc Gasol's retirement day, so we got to work out. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. Well, listen, and and it's important you mention that, Blake, because, you know, yeah, Joel had the fluid points in that series, and, like, that was kind of, that was the year when he got hit in the face by Fultz, I think, going into the play, and that was the year before. Anyway, he's had all sorts of wild things, as you guys know, but yeah. that series and the way Marc Gasol was able to shut down Joel offensively in that series is a huge part of why Joel Embiid has become the unbelievable scoring machine that he is now. Mm -hmm. Cause that, that series and the way that went caused him to totally remake how he plays his game and approach his offensive end of the court a lot differently than he did before and to get a lot better and to learn a lot about it. So, you know, obviously with Mark retiring today, it is, I do think important to point out that his, performance in that series and the way he was able to give Joel so many problems on offense early in his career is a huge part of what has turned Joel into the player he is now. Which is, hey, I mean, that's that's part of it, right? Like, that's part of ascending as a superstar in this league is yep. figuring out yep. how to beat every kind of different coverage or defender a team can throw at you. Um, when it comes to getting, let, let's, let's play out a scenario where this isn't all that serious and, and we're back on kind of day-to-day -day watch with Joel Embiid. Obviously, mm -hmm. they're going to want to be careful with him the rest of the way. They have fallen to fifth in the Eastern Conference, but they've got a five and a half game cushion off the play in spot. So, right. like, they're comfortable. Tyrese Maxey has missed the last couple games. So, this looks worse than, than maybe it is right, right this second. However, when you look at, well, Maxey's been banged up. Embiid, you really got to do more to make sure he gets to the playoff healthy. Even something like, like Joel Embiid's usage rate right now is fascinating to watch. It makes for great basketball. I, I love seeing him push the limits of how much and how efficiently a guy can score. But the it's also too high. The history of guys with usage rates that high and teams that rely mm -hmm. that much on one guy in the yeah. playoffs is really spotty. It's not very good. Like Giannis's yeah. that championship season, his usage rate came down. LeBron has never been like a 40% usage guy. Right. Like it's Westbrook and MB that and Harden. Like Harden, those are yeah. the guys who who do that. So I know that we've thought that the Sixers are going to be patient and they're going to be methodical because they have all this cap space and flexibility in the offseason. Do you think they reconsider that stance given the need to maybe get some extra help in here? Not because they're not good enough, uh, not a good enough team, but because the way they're going, it might be hard to get to mid-April at a thousand percent. I always thought they were going to add some stuff, okay. Blake. And I, I think that the difference is, do I think they're going to push in all of their chips and, you know, trade multiple first round picks for guys? No, I don't think they're going to do that. But they've got a ton of second round picks to move. They've got $100 million in expiring contracts to move. They have the ability to go get two or three guys that could add to their rotation that would be useful pieces that wouldn't cost them you know, two first round picks to go get. And I think they could do that, make their team significantly better and still have the ability if they want in the future to go make a swing for, you know, some higher level player if they become available with those future first. You know, a guy like Tyus Jones in Washington, they don't have a backup point guard really. Joel, when he's out there without Tyrese Max, he's handling the ball all the time. They probably could send a couple of seconds to Washington, two or three, to get a guy like Tyus Jones. He would help them. I think pretty significantly. Bruce Brown's another guy that I'm curious to see if they go after. You know, I'm sure we're going to talk about the Raptors later. I don't know if you're getting a first round pick for Bruce Brown if you're the Raptors, but if you can get two to four second round picks for him, like probably should do that based off where they're at, I think, and continue to add to their asset base. And, you know, you obviously have got an interesting young core centered around Emmanuel Quickly and Scotty Barnes. So, keep finding ways to augment that core. And frankly, with where the Raptors are, trying to make sure they're in the top six, improving the chance to keep their pick is probably a good idea too. So, you know, I, I think they can go get guys in that kind of ballpark, guys that are going to be bench players for you, but are going to really significantly improve their ceiling because it will raise their floor that much. Because the Sixers top four or five is really good. After that, 
They got a ton of question marks. And it's part of why Joel's usage rate is that high. So my guess is they make a couple moves like that. Again, like you said, assuming this isn't some sort of catastrophic knee situation for Joel between now and the deadline, and they save some of their chips for later. But I'll be very surprised if we get to January or February 9th and the Sixers look the same as they do now. If, that, if that's the case, I would call that a failure. And, and I don't see any real chance of them being a true threat to get out of the Eastern Conference this year. Yeah, I mean, the history of Daryl Morey led teams, like they're they're always going to tinker midseason. And he's yep. now got the picks and assorted contracts essentially to do that. A yeah, but the t- only guy he knows how to trade or trade for is James Harden. So <laughs> it, it is his go-to move. It's like Pascal spitting. He's going to do it. Um, <laughs> another team that's already more than tinkered, really. I mean, made the trade of, you know, one of the biggest trades of the season already is, is the New York Knicks who are – just yep. apparently the best team in the league. Like, they they look so much fun to watch. <laughs> they got great quotes. They're 14-2 and two since the trade for OJ Anobi. Yeah, Josh, OG... Josh Hart's got to be, like, the MVP for you right now, right? Yeah, Josh is Josh is a heck of a quote. And, <laughs> you know, it's funny. The Knicks, the Knicks really are the ultimate try-hard team. And when you say that, it sounds like a criticism, mm-hmm. right? Or you're putting them down. But really, to me, what it is is – the Knicks are always going to give you maximum effort every day. Like you show up to watch the Knicks play. They're going to play super hard. They're going to do all the right things. Tom Thibodeau, I think, has become a really underrated coach in general. People like to make fun of him for for his demeanor on the sideline and the way he plays guys. But you look at this team, they're analytically sound. Their offense is really good. They get into people and guard they are really big physically at every position and they play like it. You know, Will Hardy was talking after last night's game after they beat Utah to go to 14 to 2 in the month of January about how relentless Isaiah Hartenstein is. He's been a huge piece for them, uh, stepping into play 36, 38 minutes a game sometimes with Mitchell Robinson out. They've won the last couple games without OG and Julius Randle. And again, they are not, the Knicks aren't a championship caliber team right now. They still don't have the, the true blue superstar at the top that you need to win a title. But what they've done for the first time in a generation is methodically put together a really good, really deep, sound team that's got a lot of assets to go get the next true superstar player that becomes available, whoever that is. And between Jalen Brunson coming as a free agent, then getting them to, you know, being a key part of them getting and re-signing Josh Hart, signing Dante DiVincenzo in one of the best value contracts of the, the season or the off season this summer, getting him on a full, a four-year deal below the mid-level. And he had 33 points and nine threes last night and has been, you know, a, a quality starting caliber shooting guard for them after the, um, after the OG trade. I mean, you, you put all that together and they're a really good, really fun team to watch. And again, Maybe their ceiling is to get to the conference finals this year if they get the right couple of matchups in the first couple of rounds. But the Knicks have finally put themselves in a position where they can truly be the destination team. Whenever one of these guys mm-hmm. that everybody thinks about becomes available, they're going to say, hey, the Knicks are really good. They have stuff to trade for me. They'll still have a lot of stuff after they trade for me. That makes sense for me to go there. The Knicks add that guy. All of a sudden, they're really a championship-level team Instead of chasing from Steve Francis to Stefan Marbury to Tracy McGrady to rushing into the Carmelo trade to like mm-hmm. uh, at so many points, they've just short circuited their building process and it's left them in the same rudderless position for basically this entire century. And it took a long, long time, but I think Leon Rose deserves a lot of credit and they put themselves in a really good spot. And it's going to be interesting to see where things shake out from here over the next six to 12 months. Yeah, like this is the healthiest the Knicks have been as a just in a team build or an organization standpoint in like 20 years, basically. Since the 90s. Yeah, 30 years. Unquestionably. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. unquestionably since they were great in the 90s. They've been a mess ever since. And I think what's really impressive, what you said about Tom, is like, you know, Tibbs has brought a culture there. Like, you can tell, like, the fact that they're still winning these games. Like, Utah's playing much better. They crushed the Raptors. We've seen that. But, like... You know, you don't have OG, you don't have Randall. Those two guys are so important for this team. And they just hit the ground running. OG joins the team. He hits, he hits the ground running. That's a jazz team that's really well coached, too. Yeah. So, like, they just yeah, have Will an Hardy's, incredible Will culture. Hardy's terrific. 
They do. Yeah. And like Tom's favorite thing to say is next man up, right? Mm. He says it all the time. You ask him about guys being out, well, next man up, they got to play. And like he, he's the guy you can make fun of for, like I yeah. said, his demeanor and what he says publicly and how he goes about stuff. But they, they have a group of guys that play incredibly hard every night. And like for the fans here, I know the garden is seen as a glitzy place, understandably, mm. but like the fan base here likes teams like this. Mm. They like the team from the nineties teams that show up with a lunch pail every day and want to just grind through games. This reminds and, me of like the Raptors in like 2016 when they had like 55, 56 win seasons. Kyle is kind of like Brunson or mm -hmm. like DeMar Randall, I suppose there's some comparison. But the yeah. point is, the ultimate point is you knew their ceiling is not, they don't have LeBron, so they're not going to beat LeBron. They don't have anyone near remotely on that level, but day-to-day -day watching And like them, that Raptors team, stuff. and like that Raptors team, Lou, yeah. uh, well, that was a team that was on the ascendancy after a period of a lot of struggles, mm -hmm. right? And it was like, hey, there's this fun, exciting new era of the team. And yeah, it might not be quite where we ultimately hope to get to. And by the way, they did eventually make the deal to get yes. them the kind of player that allowed them to be that kind of team. But it was a group that you were really proud of as a fan of the Raptors to yeah. watch that team play every day. And they maximized out what they were. And I think for this Knicks group, it's the same thing. They're going to, they, they might not be a top four or five team, but they're not going to cheat you out of whatever their ceiling is. They're going to get to whatever that ultimate outcome winds up being. All right, uh, Tim, before we let you go here, uh, you also were there uh, when Ben Simmons returned the other night. You, you wrote a piece for ESPN about it. He looked real good. I know he's question or questionable or doubtful for tonight, but uh, yeah. nice to see yeah. him back and, and playing very effectively uh, off the bench. What is the next, like, I guess, 16 months look like for Ben Simmons? Like, it's maybe someone absorbs that contract in the offseason with the 40 million still owed to him next year but like what is a contract and, and trade stuff aside what is the next stage of ben simmons career look like to you i mean is he gonna play i hope so I, it's know, always a question i mean I, yeah i mean that's the thing right like he comes back on monday he missed 38 games with this back issue they initially said it was a hip issue then it was a back issue then it was a very, very slow, drawn out recovery process. He gets back. The whole idea was he kept, you know, they kept saying, want to have him come back and be able to play for a long time. Plays 18 minutes on Monday. Look great. Again, still is terrified to shoot the ball outside of a foot away from the basket. But at 6'10 and very athletic and fast and you know, a terrific passer and a guy who can hit the boards, like if he can give you 10 rebounds and 10 assists in. 18 to 20 minutes, it's still a useful player, even if he's not going to shoot. Um, but then he has an awkward fall at the end of the game and appears to tweak his knee. He says he's fine. He's listed as probable yesterday. He's downgraded to questionable today. My assumption is that's going to end up leading to him not playing. I hope that's wrong because I would like to see him play again. But especially going up against Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal and Devin Booker, it would be fun to see him guard those guys and what he looks like. But that's the whole question with Simmons. Like, I still think he has a potential to be a useful NBA player, but if he's going to play 30 games, it doesn't really matter, mm. right? So that, I think, is the, the beginning and end of it. For the Nets, his contract, like you said, potentially becomes a trade chip when it's expiring in six months. But yeah, right now, as far as his basketball future goes, it's, it's, it solely comes down to, is he going to be able to stay on the court? And it's just hard based off of the evidence of the last three years to assume he's going to be able to do that. There you go. Tim, appreciate you for joining us on the program once again. And uh, Anytime, guys. Nice to see you in Toronto, you know, when we're winning franchise again. Hopefully that's not too long in the future. I hope to be back sooner than uh, sooner than that because I love Toronto and love seeing you guys. So there hope to go. see you soon. All right. Tim Bontemps, ESPN. Um, interesting note that he doesn't think Bruce Brown can get us a first. I don't know if he said he doesn't think that or he was high, like running through a scenario where if you can't get okay, a first okay. for Bruce Brown, you should explore getting like the big package Four of seconds, seconds to at least. And look, I know people never get excited about second round picks and, and I understand, but their, their currency also, right? Like it's like yeah. the money can be used in exchange for goods and services. That's right. what second round picks are a lot of the time now. It's, uh, it's, it's like a stocking stuffer. But anyway, we're going to take another break right here. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new chunky spicy chicken noodle soup. Welcome back to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Swim Lou. I am joined in studio 
by co-host Blake Murphy, and we are joined by a friend of the program, inventor of basketball feelings, Katie Heinel, writer at large, soon to be author. Uh, you know, any other compliments, Blake? Did I did I miss anything else? Uh, probably a lot. To be yeah, honest. probably a lot. Also, yeah. like professor. There's there's all sorts of basketball professor. Is that is that this preferred term? I mean, it hasn't happened yet. As of next week, you could say. Harvard professor. Harvard professor. Wait, hold on, hold, yeah. on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes. Bruce Brown can wait. Yes, yeah. Harvard professor. You obviously have not read the latest basketball feelings because there's a little a drop in there about it in subtle writing drop. about Russ. Like, yeah. Was subtle, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, tell us how that came about. Uh, the great writer Louisa Thomas, who yes. is the New Yorker sports writer, she teaches a class at Harvard called the Art of Sports Writing, and she asked me to come in and do a guest spot. She asked me before. Uh, the Russell Westbrook snub. But I am, ironically, teaching a piece I wrote about Russell Westbrook. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, the Russell Westbrook snub. Do you want to start there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't really want to, but yeah, no. we can. We uh, can. Look, we're going to talk happier <laughs> stuff. We're going to talk Bruce Brown and Marcus Gasol and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, let, let's do the rest thing. So your latest basketball feelings mm -hmm. um, was about gentleness, but also about your interaction with, with Russ the other day. Uh, before that interaction... I know you're a big Russell Westbrook fan generally, as am I. You know, that was a, a sleepy Friday night game where the Raptors didn't expect to be that good. I'm like, I'm not taking this game off. There, how many chances are left to see Russell Westbrook? And, and yeah, Kawhi, I guess, and Norm, whatever. But, like, Russ. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Jeremy Castleberry saw <laughs> yeah. him as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Getting, sure, getting a lot of shots up pregame. <laughs> um, but for you to see Russ in the environment and role he's in now, where he's had to change, obviously, coming off the bench, not a max contract player anymore, but he's still so Russell Westbrook mm -hmm. within that role. Um, how cool has that been for you For you to watch that development as a Russell Westbrook fan and see him kind of find this way to still be purely himself in a new space? I mean, I think as a deep Russell Westbrook truther, it's kind of the ideal situation that I always wanted for him to have. Um, it's something that I thought, like, pretty much right after OKC. I thought he would get it in Houston and didn't have Wizards, maybe it was a far cry, but, like, you know, you got to hope. Um, same with the Lakers. It's, like, a place where he can land, play the way he plays, and it, for a team to kind of accept that with a grain of salt, which I think is how you've got to take it. Like, he didn't come up in an era where, you know, you were a star because of your playmaking and the things you did for your teammates. He came up in an era where you were supposed to be the one and only superstar. Mm -hmm. and I think you can see that pretty clearly in his game. Um, however, I, I was getting to the point where I didn't think it was really going to happen, and you know, it, it has with the Clippers, and it's been such a great and complimentary fit. I think, you know, I, I take, I don't know if I should take pride, but I'm very <laughs> happy that it kind of comes away from his detractors that he, you know, that, that for so long I think he was talked about as an athlete that couldn't change and didn't really have the capacity for it, and now you see him coming off the bench. You know, he still gets to be this kind of, like, wild windmill of a man on the floor mm -hmm. like we were watching him together well like yeah. that game and like he was all over the place he was. you know like dunking on guys up 20 and like chirping at grady dick <laughs> yeah it's like dude, dude you're trying to win a championship and yeah you're, but yeah. like he's just yeah. he can't not be russell westbrook there's no offs yeah like he's in the tunnel before the game like like yeah. moments before he gets on he's like racing on the bike you know like he's russell westbrook all the time and if you oh, want yeah. this guy on your team you have to accept like the complete package of that. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to the Clippers' credit, they really have. I don't know if that's because, like, you've got all these other kind of buffering superstar personalities that he is not the lodestar anymore in that way either. Like, people don't look at him like that. So I think it's just, like, been such a sweet fit for him. Uh, I love that he still gets to dunk, you know. You get really sad when you don't see Russell Westbrook with the same kind of bounce he used mm -hmm. to have. But, no, I'm I'm so happy with the fit. Which is something I wanted to talk to him about. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry you didn't get to do that. At least you got the nice compliment on, true, on your true. outfit. Yeah. Um, I got a fake compliment. So to pivot wow. back to... Wait for this segue. So to pivot <laughs> from people who said no to being interviewed by you mm. to people who were traded to Toronto but might not be here very long, if at all. Alonzo Mourning also <laughs> shot you down. We'll get to the Bruce Brown wow. part. Uh, eventually, that was, a, that was but, a bar level pump fake right yeah, there. Yeah, uh, do we want to? That's an and one for Blake Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> do we want to take some shots at Alonzo Mourning for being a big meanie or what? No, because he he did he he respectfully declined. Okay. Uh, I wanted to. I gave you, and I, I I knew you would like that. I knew that was like a neat seg for you to take. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk to Alonzo for an essay that I'm writing in my upcoming book, uh, specifically about the way that we kind of age athletes out of 
their ta- like they uh, they their talent ages premature to their bodies in a lot of mm-hmm. cases. And the way that we kind of talk about them, their bodies in the abstract, and where they're really only as good or as worthwhile as how good they are on the floor. You know, and Alonzo Mourning is kind of interesting case because obviously he retired, but he he had had a full career by the time he retired. He was thirty eight, I think, um, and he had he had to retire because of his kidney. Like mm-hmm. he needed a kidney operation, so that would have been a career changing kind of career ending operation. Um, but he kind of had the grace of being able to look back. And Chris Bosch is someone else I wrote about in that same essay. And you know, Lonzo got to be he's now the VP of player development for the Heat. But I wanted to talk to him. <laughs> this is just going to be of like what I wanted to, to mm. ask all these guys about. <laughs> I wanted to talk to him about what kind of you know insight or like anything he kind of told Bosch, because I think Bosch very much felt like he was out prematurely. Mm-hmm. Like he had a whole kind of campaign we the next for year. for years that yeah. he wanted to come back and, and the NBA's exactly. fitness to play panel, which is right. the same panel that'll kind of decide if and when Christian Coloco can come back yeah. from a right. similar uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah. Out of his hands a little bit. And like the interesting thing about Bosch to me was he was someone who, who explicitly said that. He was like, my talent is still there. I know my talent is there. And I'm so fascinated by this idea of, okay, like in an athlete's mind, if your body is saying no, and in, in Bosch's case, if like it's it's morbidly dangerous mm-hmm. to play, but you still think like I have the talent, I can do this. Like, what is that like? Like, how do you process like this thought of talent outside of your body? Mm-hmm. A little bit abstract, but you know, I thought Lonzo would no, be a good cool. person I, to talk to about it. Yeah, it sounds like a it's a cool idea, and I, I obviously don't steal this for, idea. I'm not. I'm, Everyone. I'm <laughs> looking forward to reading all of the essays in your book. <laughs> But I also think it's an interesting one, you know, the the f- not even flip side of that, but like adjacent to this, this 11 game stretch we're seeing from Thad Young, mm. where Thad Young has said all year, I'm 35, I'm not not playing because I can't anymore. Mm-hmm. It's because like the team situation and the way the league works has said I can't. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily a body versus talent thing for him. It's a, uh, hey, the way we treat or the way we, the assumptions we make about age and bodies and things like that versus, you know, what you can actually do in the situations you're in. Yeah, it's like that joke, right, of, like, the oldest NBA player yes. walking on the court. A miracle of um, science. He's 36, a miracle. Like, yeah. <laughs> are, are, there, are there people in this room who are 36 and above? Yep. Yeah. yeah. No, not here, but... A uh, miracle. Every day. <laughs> I, I did shock myself because I was doing the, the recap, and I'm like, that young played so well, I can't believe it. At his big age, he did all that. And I was like, but wait, hold on. He's not that old. He's, like, four years older than me. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> That's coming for me. Yeah, Dude, I'm, that's I'm, coming for I me. will never come back from the Kyle Lowry trade for yeah. a lot of reasons, mm. but also Kyle was the last guy older than me by six Ooh. weeks, and they traded him for Goran Dragic, who is one day younger than me. Oh, and it was like as on you. the nose as it can it's get. Personal. It's like you are now older than everyone in this room. Yeah, that's Raptors personal. had younger aspirations. Yeah, Actually, that sure, that sounds really weird. I'm not. Yeah, that's there. uh, um, you take it to OKC there. I don't want to go oh, there. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, the man with many weaknesses. Um, okay, so that was, you know, that was a, there's no segue to Bruce Brown. No, there? there's not. Is there a segue to Bruce Brown? So, I'm uh, wearing cowboy boots, but you can't see them. Ooh, red cowboy oh, there's boots, this, There's the seg. Yeah. That is a I good knew segue. we were talking T- about Bruce people Brown. People watching on TV could see a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Those should be sure. covered in shadows. Gotcha. You can't see our midsection, but you can sometimes see feet on the shot. This is kind is, of uh, a country. Man, you're getting weird again. Bench. Uh, I am getting yeah. weird again. feet on the show. What was I going to say about Bruce no Brown? No free so, feet. <laughs> definitely not on this show. Uh, okay, so post game, after the last Raptor game, I'm like just in the tunnel and, you know, whatever. And, and I see Bruce Brown walking around in a cowboy hat, mm-hmm. in like straight cut jeans and like cowboy boots with a heel. And I was like, you know what? This is exactly how you were billed to me. From reading a lot of Katie's work, but um, <laughs> g- give us uh, give us your thoughts on Bruce Brown. So obviously the the, the tie in here, I suppose, is that Bruce Brown had a good game, but maybe it's also that he had a good fit recently. I was really heartened to see him wearing the boots because I think I even told you I was kind of worried about how he was settling into mm-hmm. Toronto. What he kind of thought about right. not just the team but the city because he hadn't busted out the boots yet. I've been looking at the tunnel fits and they were kind of lackluster in that department. So I'm glad that he brought them out. I feel like it was a good morale like barometer. Um, I like him on the Raptors so much. I'll say that with a caveat of, I don't know if it's going to last. Mm-hmm. I would like it to, um, because you've, we've already seen so early, like what he's been so good at, at all these other teams, which is like, he's sort of the perfect conductor. And I mean, 
not a train conductor, uh, like an energy. Mm. He's like an energy conductor. You know, okay. you can see him as this kind of perfect outlet of being able to spot what the team needs in motion, mm -hmm. whether that's like passing, getting a quick shot off. Like he makes such great decisions and he kind of lifts everybody else around him. He is also an energy spark plug. He plays super hard, mm -hmm. both ends of the floor. And I think that, you know, what team wouldn't love that? However, I know we we're going to talk about maybe patience in like a rebuild situation. I do feel it's almost like a bit of a monkey's paw situation for me because it's like it's someone I would love to see on the Raptors, but it's not the right time is what it kind of feels like to me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> Damn. No, it's <laughs> poetic. I've heard, it's that, also in, I've like, heard that in breakups. So. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, is good. this is good. Yeah, it's not. It's oh, not God. us. It's Bruce Brown. I mean, um, other way around, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but, but even like, it's like to to tie it back to the age conversation, like yeah. it's also wild that like Bruce Brown is twenty seven years old, still like only entering what like even if we went analytically with it, like only the early part of his peak of his mm -hmm. career, and he's being talked about like yeah, he's too old for for this situation, even though he is like all of those nice things yeah. and like obviously contract realities and trades and stuff come into it but it's pretty wild that like at 27 now you know a month ago that would have fit perfectly because pascal's 29 and og's 26 and stuff sure. and now it's like oh my god he's 27 get him out of here yeah too too old for us no i like it but i think that's true right and like i, I do not want to prematurely age bruce brown the young bruce no brown. he's only 27 yeah come on he is he is it's funny in like the nba time scale which is in itself just like a rapid and warp thing uh, -huh. uh he is in like the prime of his career you know he's Fully. a champion yeah. he's a he's a champion just won a title i think he wants to land somewhere where he can play and contribute long term and probably win another title um so i could understand the reticence you know, but I can also understand from the Raptors perspective, it's like, this is somebody a lot of teams really want right now. You guys both know I don't like talking about athletes in this way. Yeah. So, so <laughs> what do you think that's like for him and to kind of make it basketball feelings-y? <laughs> like he is in this transitional place where you, you've you been dropped in somewhere and you're being asked to find your place and fit in and be a good teammate on and off the court, get mm -hmm. to know these guys, while at least for the next eight days, there is this thing hanging over you that's saying, well, this might only be transitional. Like, mm -hmm. like, don't get comfortable. Don't he he made the joke, he's not signing a lease. Like this idea of you have to fit in somewhere that might be very, very impermanent. I think it's absolutely really tough. Like I did a whole story about this with the RIP Spinsters podcast, but you know, what it feels like to get traded and like talk to a few alumni, rookies, just like anyone who's been on a different side of a team trade. Some who like Matt Bonner went on to win a title with the Spurs. It was a great trade for him. You know, but in other cases, it's not. And I think it really speaks to the professionalism of an athlete. I think in Bruce Brown's case, like, we've seen that, you know, whether it's just, like, in his gameplay or, like, in his postgame, you know, avails, like, which if, I wish there would be more. <laughs> While he's here, let's get him. Let's yeah. get him talking. All right, we got to play recovery. a home game. They they <laughs> yeah. have no home games yeah, left before the, the trade deadline the, is uh, part of the, the issue too. here too. Damn, um, might have already run its course. But I think it's tough, and I, like I think for someone who is obviously searching for his next permanent situation, and I think Bruce Brown sort of falls into categories of like, unfortunately, a lot of really good athletes. Like I think of a PJ Tucker, like maybe just before this, but like who are so good and, and like so unique to a skill set and have honed themselves to be able to do a little bit of everything and this NBA are so worthwhile for that, but still overlook to a degree that I don't necessarily understand, get kind of pegged as these like journeymen. It's like, oh, they're they're pretty happy to just like go where the next contract is. But right. like, I do think somebody like Bruce Brown is obviously looking for longevity too, like great uh -huh. contract, yes, mm -hmm. but like also some longevity and where he can kind of establish himself and like learn from other athletes. Because again, yeah, he's, he still has a long road ahead of him, like, let's hope, you know, and teach guys after him, which is what I do love about the fit in Toronto. Um, we'll see. Hmm. Yeah. We yeah. will see, honestly. But short, I, I short appreciate stint, this. Potentially, yeah. I mean, it, it, I, you know what? I, I like this because we are so used to having sports conversations that are like, okay, it's just really about what are you providing me right now? in these tangible terms right. that are like points, rebounds, or blocks, or here's uh, an advanced stat version of this or whatever. And if you do this, then, th then this and this, and you just jump from node to node on this decision tree. 
Like, as soon as Bruce Brown got here, it was like, all right, what can we trade him for? Can we get a first-round pick? But, like, by the way, like, Tim is groveling for this kind of stuff. Tim yeah. texted me to clarify. He said uh, he thinks it's unlikely they get a first for Bruce Brown, but he thinks they should explore yeah. the packages of, like, multiple seconds. So he wanted to clarify. We're doing that right he, now. He, We're he groveling off of Tim Montex. I'm yeah. not groveling. I'm not uh, groveling. No, but I, I appreciate this because this is the other side of it, too, where it's just like, you know, this is why, I mean, this is just, like, a commentary on, like, you know, seeing you in this Toronto market and, working alongside you sometimes is just mm. like this is what the perspective that is missing we don't even have these conversations most times about how do you feel about this it, it how, took what pascal is it, what's the getting dealt like? in the way he did after yeah. like a year-long drama for us to be able to have space to talk about that situation in that way yeah i mean yes or no i mean we could have made that conversation we could have made that space ourselves but it's, as hosts. sure but like it's that, also yeah. like it's an as we talked about when we did talk about it like it is a little awkward to like on a tuesday after a game yeah. just like start talking about the way it feels for Pascal Siakam or not whatever. To me. Um, not to me. Katie's not like, to you, no. Katie's like, look it's around. Bread like, and this butter. Is, this my bread is why you're It didn't you. exist before we were here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, yeah. I, that is very kind of you. I do appreciate that. And I think I'm always heartened, you know, by like seeing different perspectives, talk about the game now in a different way. I do think this is growing, this way to kind of address and talk about it. it is, and I also think that has to do with fandom because... Mm -hmm. NBA fandom is so rabid, sometimes to a point where you're a little bit like, whoa, like, let's yeah. cool it. Like, a lot of times like The that. trade machine is broken. It's like there's smoke sure. pouring out of that mm -hmm. thing. And then other times it's like, I think sometimes the intensity that, of people wanting to know and understand and learn more about athletes actually leads very nicely and complementary to, to these kinds of conversations. Fingers crossed. And I, I think it's why, you know, I, I really appreciated when you made the point, and you made this on Twitter and you wrote about it as well, but, you know, I think it was J.J. Redick kind of leading the charge. And I love J.J. Redick. I love the podcast. I love what he brings to the broadcast. But this kind of push oh, that, like, this is what has to happen in media coverage where I think that, like, it's good. Like, obviously, for someone like me, the more, like, hard analysis stuff like mm -hmm. versus narrative-driven or whatever, yes. But that's not the only thing. And it's not the only type of fan. And it's not the only thing that people can or should be taking mm -hmm. away from the game. Like, like yeah, we need to get... If that is replacing only the lowest common denominator toxic stuff that's a part of it, awesome. But if it's taking up all the space from the different types of way to be mm -hmm. a fan, then that's not a good thing. Yeah, I think, like, generally, if there's more ways to talk about basketball, mm -hmm. all fans will respond to that. Just because it might not be your lane, like, that's fine. You could, you know, if you're more analytically brain, there's lots of people mm -hmm. to go talk to that about, you know. But I think in general, like, it is... it is. I have to choose to look at it as a, as a heartening thing. Otherwise, sometimes it's just like you're just talking and writing out into the void mm -hmm. is what it can feel like. But I'm seeing a change, and I think uh, it's really important. And I do think I see more of it now than when I started covering basketball, especially around things like the trade deadline of people yeah. being like, oh, I wonder like, I wonder how that feels. Or like, you know. I think a lot of that's your influence. Like, I'm not even kidding, especially in the blogger sphere that, like, we exist in. Right. Which is yeah. a very insular world, I'll like, acknowledge. But I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. acknowledge we're, that. we're not. That's true. You're, we're not you're real mainstream. Yeah. That was the last time I even wrote, man. I don't even write 10 <laughs> things anymore. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Raptors lose. I mean, here's a pod. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> um, okay. So, we, um, anyway, we, here's here's a React pod. You yeah. Know? Not, not yeah. Wonderwall. Um, yeah. Man. Okay. So, I think we can, we can kind of blend these two, or whether they like it or not, Raptors fans might be headed toward. You have to blend these two things a little bit anyway, because like yeah. to take it from the Bruce Brown thing where, yes, the second he was acquired, everyone's like, okay, what can you do on the court? But also what can you get for us in trade? You know, there's an immediacy to that because that trade happened three weeks, four weeks before the trade deadline and we're eight days out here. But Katie, the, the moves the Raptors have made, everything Masai Ujiri said in his press conference, he said he used the term multiple times, patience. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be relative to the last 10 or 11 years for this franchise and this fan base. That's going to be a new thing. Mm -hmm. And you you texted me earlier, you know, you've sensed some kind of sticker shock a little bit in, you know, everyone kind of realizing what this could look like. Um, I guess, like, sometimes patience feels like a binary thing. Like, you, or you either are patient or you are not. Um, but can people, like, learn? Can you develop patience as you're being told you have to be patient? How is this going to work? <laughs> Get ready to learn patience. Bro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Because that's what this rebuild is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the sticker shock thing is funny. It's not, I mean, to me, it is funny because I think, you know, we, I feel like, saw it a little bit in slow motion because mm -hmm. it felt like, you know, it, every summer it was like, hurry up and wait. And like, we got to make a trade. Like, things have mm -hmm. to happen now. These like contracts are expiring, you know, et cetera. And then 
things would stop and stall out and it felt like it would never happen. So I think there was a lot of impatience in that. So when the move finally came, I think it was quite a relief to a lot of fans or just even, you know, from a perspective of like, okay, maybe now we're going to get a sense of like, what is the next iteration and identity of this team look like? Which to me hasn't really been clear since post title run for a lot of other reasons. But like, oh, yeah, totally. it's just like, I don't think it's a defensive team which they said it was for a long time. Like, I don't think it was. It ain't anymore. It's certainly not now. But, like, under Nick Nurse, like, that was always, you know, that's that's what we're going with. It felt like a lot of kind of hanging on to sort of old adages of the past. So I think, to a degree, the changes were really welcome because people are tired of being patient. But the huge grain of salt is, like, in a rebuild, which up until now, I don't think Masai ever used the word. It was like, we're going to retool, we're going to make some adjustments, which is much easier to do. A rebuild, you're like, you asked for it. And now you're looking at like several years probably of this kind of basketball, hopefully incremental improvements here and there, maybe a play in situation, maybe like if the in season tournament keeps going, like that's mm. a great aim for this, for this specific team. But I think it's going to be a real rude, I want to say a rude awakening, but almost just like rude adjustment of expectations. Mm. Not that they have to be low, but they should be realistic. Yeah, you can't simulate until 2025 now, right? Like, it's not 2K if you if you tear down. You can't just skip ahead to the good season. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think... 2K has contributed to the commodification of players, but that's a separate At least their trade machine works and actually follows the cap rules. At least you can, like, make a cool... Why are you making person? cap rules in a 2K game? Let me just trade. <laughs> turn, you can turn it off. LeBron. You can turn it off. I'm just like, what kind of okay, clothes yeah. can I get in a video 2K? game. I've yeah. never played it. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, sure. But I think... That's what you talk, what I'm trying to say is like you talk about a rebuild for so long and you're gearing up to it and it's like what everybody says they want and I feel like every kind of outside media story about the Raptors for the last year and a half, two years yeah. has just been like they got to tear it down. Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, they, they did. Are you now prepared for the outcome of that? And I, that's where patience comes in. And as someone who I'd say when I've always been a Raptors fan, but like my fandom really distilled in like the early Kyle DeMar years and like the all these like failed attempts at running mm. up to something. And like patience was absolutely necessary, yeah. you know, in those runs. And I think probably that's where I got good at it in a basketball sense. But there's a whole new like wave in the fan base now who've never known like a very bad yeah, <laughs> Raptors yeah. team. Right. So I want, that's what I wonder. That's why I'm kind of like, it's, are you ready? Like, are you, you wanted it. Yeah. Do you feel ready for this? Well, this is why I keep bringing this up to people and, and trying to almost have this conversation daily on the show because I always feel the sense of like, all right, I have to tell myself that like I'm turning on this television to watch the Raptors tonight and I'm going to manually switch off the part of me that's like I'm expecting a win and I want everything that they do to contribute towards this win. Mm -hmm. And if they're winning, make some cool plays to make it look better. I'm manually having to switch that off every single game. And it's a weird feeling because, you know, it's not happening. Now, I think on the flip side, you take some of that pressure off. There might be more room for young players to make mistakes, grow, explore what they have. That's what patience is mm -hmm. for a lot of this in the basketball sense in a tangible way. But for the fan base, like, yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm the only one who's going to have to adjust to that. There's going to be a period where you're like, damn, this team sucks. I can't, I can't believe this is what it is. Some people might just, you know, drop it all together and then say, you know what, if they're not winning, that's what I care about. Yeah. They're not consuming anymore. That's normal. But I also think that there's going to be a huge portion of fan base that just, like, learns and adjusts and grows with it. Because, I mean, for me, like, my fandom of the Raptors crystallized, like, the year Vince Carter left. That was yeah. when I joined the Raptors fan base. Yeah. Like, my expectations were, like, super low. Not to say that, like, that's the standard and we, we should get back there. We should never get back there. That was terrible. <laughs> but, like, in a similar way, it's like, yeah, you, you lost your star player for, like, not much in, in, immediately in return other than Bruce Brown's cowboy outfit, which was really nice. But, like... You know, you have to learn and grow and adjust to that. And there was a period where you got to really love even not losing, but who they are even when the losses, right? So, like, I got really attached to Jamario Moon. Pops Mensabatsu who came in for a 10-day contract and he got a bunch of rebounds. I love that guy. You know, like, uh, the, the young guns. Do they win games? No. But are we going to have a pretense that they might one day upset the heat? Yes. The Young like, Guns were the first ever Raptors meme created. Yeah, like absolutely. them on the tank. <laughs> it's like the first meme yeah. in Raptors Photoshop history. Photoshop was like made more relatively yeah. available. And the immediate thing that Raptor fans did was Photoshop Sonny Weems going up against like, you know, 
Dwayne Wade. Like, like uh, I don't know if that's it an makes aspect of this, though. like that's part of the game. I recognize this is a bit of a corny way to look at it, but I think it makes for more resilient fandom when you have stretches like that. Because like one, also for like the real basketball brains, you're looking for like to your point, Will. For every game, you're looking at just incremental improvements. So if you want to yeah, get yeah. real down to like the X's and O's, there's going to be plenty of those when it's mm -hmm. like you might have a stinker of a game and like not come away with the win, but there'll be improvements for every player on that roster, right? Or it, like in big or small ways. And then like, you know, for fan favorites, how long has it been since we've had it? Like a psycho T style? <laughs> Like, let's get... Yeah. Let's, I, okay, all right. I didn't think you'd go there, but sure, yeah. I'm, yeah. I just mean, like, I forgot about that till you said it, but, like, uh -huh. I had so many... Like, that's how Amir Johnson started for me. Mm -hmm. He yes. was now just, like, yes. one of my, like, forever favorites. Exactly. But, like, he started as that kind of, like, okay, like that's, I'm going to get behind this guy. Like, yeah. I don't know why. I just have a good feeling. You know? Amir Johnson taught me analytics. It's like, how come they keep winning all the time oh, yeah, when yeah. he's on the court and he's not actually doing anything in the box score? I don't understand. And why, then Why is his WS... Per 48.189. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. You know, like, let's learn. Um, the, the other part of this, too, is like, and, and this isn't, um, you know, this isn't to say some type of fan enjoyed 2019 more than others. But like, and, and the hardest part about this, I think, is that there is no promise that all this patience leads anywhere. Right. Of course. Yeah. But yeah. 2019 was so special for a lot of people because of what came before it. And that yeah. build up to that. And Absolutely. like some very difficult turning points where like you got to. You got to trade away Demar, mm -hmm. and that's really, really difficult given where you've been. Yeah. And you go back to JV, you're gone. Oh and like God. 2016, maybe because of where the expectations were, and, and like I'm, it's not, it was not more, it was not better than 2019. But like that playoff run in 2016, coming off the two years that they've yeah. had, where it was like, okay, you're accidentally good. Here's your first taste of the playoffs. The future's so bright, and then the next year, it's like, Ugh, yeah, that's that hurts. And then to get to that level, like that's. That's about the most fun you can have watching a team grow up. And, like, yeah. you're not promised that by being patient now. But, like, that's the kind of stuff that could come, not next, but after that, mm. which is, like, super rewarding as a fan. When you see your, when you see the the guys or the, or the girls or the team grow and take those next steps and run into each of those kind of successive challenges, um, successful or otherwise, um, that's a really rewarding thing to see that kind of growth. Mm. And, like, we, we all had it as, like, Kyle DeMar and unfortunately DeMar had to go as part of it and it's probably why I personally tie so much of the the championship stuff to Kyle specifically mm -hmm. um but yeah it's cool it's very rewarding to to go through that uh, and be at it from you know the ground floor it's just not promised is all I think the last thing about patience too and I think this gets lost really quickly especially in the way that people have really grown towards the kind of like deal making and like front office aspect of of fandom and basketball everybody is just watching as if they work in aggregation you know feed me a little morsel i'm gonna listen to this whole hour 50 podcast so that i can maybe get a little sliver of like tim Pontem said the raptors probably can't get a there's first stuff i know that i'm time. not gonna say on the podcast <laughs> i'll tell everyone that right now <laughs> like i'm not yeah yeah no, but I mean, it's, like, anyway, sorry. I just want to interrupt. But, uh, it, it's it's okay. just weird. No, it is weird. But, like, I think what's lost in that, if we're talking about patience, is, mm -hmm. you know, there, there is strategy involved. But the thing about picking a strategy and, like, sticking to it is run offices don't necessarily have the luxury of, like, it doesn't work out in the first dozen games of that strategy that mm -hmm. they've chosen. They can't just be like, cool, new strategy. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, we've invested <laughs> quite a bit of time and money, yeah. personnel, training, everything into it. So I think that's what gets lost too is like you think, you know, the team makes a boneheaded move. It's like that's not just coming out of the ether, right? There is a strategy in place. Mm -hmm. And the idea of any strategy is it should be long term mm -hmm. or long term with options to kind of like get off the highway at any given point should certain things like shake out, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that gets lost a little bit. Yeah. Also that there are 29 other front offices trying to do, do a strategy that beats thing. yours and limits yours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the worst thing about sports is that everyone's competing against each other all the time and it's so cutthroat. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's also maybe some of the best parts about it too. Uh, all right. Last thing. Marcus All retired? Yeah. So Marcus All, if you haven't seen already, go to his Instagram page. You'll see uh, a really nicely crafted video of him hanging it up. Just like, you know, just leaving and... You know, the, the classic, like, shut the lights off. Oh. You know, like, it, it was like a scene. I haven't watched it yet. You haven't seen I'm it? I'm getting goosebumps. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so he's sitting in the office, and the office is lit. And it's overlooking the, I guess, the Hirona basketball, like, court in the arena. And then the arena shuts off its lights. But you could just see Mark and the silhouette of him 
lit in the room. I know, it's chills. Uh, <laughs> it's a radio medium somehow, but just go watch the video. It's really nice. But yeah, Mark is officially retired. The question is what next, you know, and... Wrap the uh, show guest appearance. Oh my Let's God, go. yo, Mark, please, please, I am begging. Um, but yeah, your your general thoughts on Marcus Saul and also just like fun memories of Mark in a short time as a Raptor. One, Mark, please respond to my emails about talking to you. Oh, we're all begging for, for Mark certain, publicly? Yeah. yeah great. <laughs> I mean, maybe it works. I don't know. Okay, get, get back to Katie first and then get back to me. Please. Yeah. Well, that's what I want to pick your beautiful brain about. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, it's funny you mentioned the JV trade because when the Raptors first traded for Mark, I was so, I was just like, no. You know, I was so yeah, against it. Okay. All right. Getty, I was like flying back from Mexico City. Like, who, I don't want this guy. Like, he doesn't fit with the team. <laughs> okay. Like, J, real JV hive, you know? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. It took a long time to come around to this guy. Okay. Um, but as soon as I did, I was just like, this man is a genius. He this is. This man is a basketball defensive genius. That like, and I know everybody says it, but I, like, I just, I really feel like so much is lost. He is not someone who, like, uh, like I don't know, analytics was made for, you know? And, like, the box score was not made for him, just in mm. terms of, like, the impact that he has. Well, when your impact is things that don't happen, yeah. right? It's harder to... It's, you're, yeah, you're the ghost. Yeah, yeah. You're, the, you're the one taking away. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, you're the one taking everything away from everybody else and making sure they can't have things. You're haunting Giannis's dreams at night. Literally, according said. to Giannis. Yeah. yeah. Giannis talks a lot about his dreams, man. I like that. Yeah. I respect that. He's I know like, people say don't do it, it's boring, but he also can, talks about, I like their dreams. He also talks about dreams. thinking about the Pacers while he's trying to... That's what I mean. <laughs> like, yeah. He's yeah. just he's thinking about basketball maybe a little too much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah work-life balance, you know, maybe <laughs> a healthy thing. But, uh. yeah, like Mark just... He just... Like, one is so essential to the title. Would not Absolutely. have happened without yeah. Mark Gasol. Like, absolutely figured out a way to shut down the Bucks, then the Sixers, you know, in mm -hmm. quick succession, um, made it look incredibly easy. There's something about a big, like, Mark who's, like, it's very rare now. I wouldn't, I compare it to Bam Adebayo only in the way that they're able to move their bodies in this kind of, like, balletic, really graceful, but you're still, like, a giant, you're, like, a ballerina that is a brick wall, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, he could still do that. He could also just stand there and be the brick wall. Sure, yeah. When you say he, he moves like a ballerina, you mean when he did this thing after the three, right? Which I loved. Yeah, <laughs> which I loved. Um, right. Yeah, man. My Probably my best memory of Marcus Hall is being so sleep deprived, getting back from Chicago All-Star, I think it was, that I was walking down the chute to the floor and I had one of the Rice Krispies, RIP those Rice Krispie squares from the media room. Oh, but I had that's one. a different conversation. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But I had one a little inside. Yeah. Uh, and I was walking down the street and I just see this shadow backlit. So I couldn't see who it is walking. And I'm just like lifting it up to him to yeah. offer it. Oh, wow. And then it, Marcus Hall, like basically came out of the mist and my brain checked itself. I was like, uh -huh. what are you doing? <laughs> like, put your hand down. Oh, I, I thought Beautiful. this was going to end with Marcus Hall, like, split the rice krispies. He kind of looked yeah, at me like, that. You know, like this like giant a, bear man comes out of yes. the shadows yeah. and eats your treat. On That's you. what I was trying to make happen, but then it's yeah. like you got to get it. Do not feed well. the gasols. Yeah, uh, like you got a favorite Mark uh, moment? Anything? I, I mean, it's tough to top the parade and just how into it he was. Yeah. Um, how you know tone setter he was for that parade very yeah. early on. Um, I would also say just like, and you don't get to know the players that well off the court necessarily. But from the moment he got to Toronto, there was a kindness and a softness to him yeah. with media, with a lot of requests of him because of the Spanish language media mm -hmm. in Toronto. Um, just, you know, young guys making requests to him. The, what we know about him off the court, like as a father, as a humanitarian, yep. um, things like it, it just like there aren't really boxes that Marc Gasol hasn't checked on or off the basketball court. It's it's kind of who you want to... He's the type of person you want to be a part of your organization and the type of person you want to root for. Yeah. Um, I think the key word you mentioned there for me that stood out is the humanitarian aspect because yeah. one of the best stories I've ever written and, or, or ever like read is, you know, if you just search it up, it's on ESPN. Diary of a Rescue, Marc Gasol's Mission to the Mediterranean. And uh, the author here, um, Gene, he actually travels with Mark as he is doing, like, rescue missions in the Mediterranean for refugees and trying to pull people, literally life and death situations, and try to rescue them. And they, it goes with, I mean, first off, I haven't seen any NBA player make a commitment like this 
in general. Um, but you can definitely tell where it's coming from. Yeah, obviously, there's a gigantic mi migrant crisis that's happening there in the first place. And Mark doing his thing to try to be on the more humanitarian aspect on that and, and not try to shut down these borders and actively trying to rescue these migrants. It's like, to me, one of the coolest things I've seen from any athlete, period, mm -hmm. that he spent his time doing this. So if you haven't read the story, go make sure you, you read that about Mark. So I knew that about him coming into Toronto, the type of person that he would like to be. Um, on the court, obviously, the, the contributions to the championship are incredible. Holding Joel Embiid to zero points is incredible. Underrated thing for me, just him and Mark, him and Kawhi Leonard, like, downloading that little synergy of just, like, he just gives a head nod, and then all of a sudden, it's a backdoor pass, and Kawhi's dunking on somebody. Like, they did that so often, and mm -hmm. they didn't even have time as teammates. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, they just, they just figured that out. They just understood each other. That's the thing. There was nothing on the basketball court that, like, Mark Gasol couldn't understand and process. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it was just incredible to have this, this guy who was also, especially at that point of his career, super selfless and just wanted to make winning plays happen. And Also a huge part of the run left, up, man. Yeah, yeah. And, and a huge part of that run at back season being as successful as it was oh, yeah. until everything shut down was, like, Marcus all just, like, defying, to circle back to the very start of this conversation, defying what the restraints we normally put on an aging player with his particular body type as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think from, like, you both touched on it. It's like, and I, because I'm not trying to, you, these were both such poignant examples. <laughs> and I think that too, because to me, I think it all comes down to the expansiveness that he has. And something I always remember is just like, he left and chose to leave the NBA, go back and play in Spain. Yes. He bought this basketball school that was so meaningful to him as a kid, which is not just a basketball school, but it's a school for young men as well who maybe don't have access to those kinds of, mm -hmm. um, not just, again, like sports facilities, but educational facilities, because yep. it was, it meant so much to him. But that, that was his idea of success. That more than trying to win another title with the Lakers, for example. And I think, again, we can get so narrow with it's like success or bust in the NBA. And Marcus Gasol was someone who always had just a broader, like, real-life capacity for understanding, mm -hmm. like, no, there's much more out there. Yeah, because he fully could still be in the league right now, just, like, yeah. bouncing league minimums. and He oh, would maybe. start for the Raptors right now. Absolutely, man. Um, but, like... He chose instead purposely to to give back to essentially what kind of created for him, mm -hmm. and that's awesome. And that's why I'm very curious with what's next for Mark because, you know, I I don't know. It could be anything, but I know it's gonna be something really good. Anything. So, thank you, Marcus All, for everything you did for the Raptors. And uh, I know it's been a long time and everything like that, but you know, your legacy will always live on in Toronto. I, I never see Marcus All jerseys, by the way. No, no thirty threes in Toronto, and that's a shame. That's true. You never see it. You see Serge. You see, obviously, the other numbers. You see some Kawhi's. Like moon every now and then, too. There's a lot of Jamar. There's a lot of moon. moon. I see some Anthony Parkers. Yeah. I, You know, I'd love to see some 33s. I'd love to run into somebody wearing a Marcus Soul jersey, Raptor jersey. Yeah. I was, uh, I know we're, we really need to take a break, but the I weekend mean, that he got traded, I included this in our article the other day. It's one of my favorite stories, but I was on the I was on the road with the team mm -hmm. the when the trade happened. Um, so there's that the Atlanta game where like they have no players yeah. and then the New York game there's this big scramble I've written an article of like uh, the Raptors are violating the collective bargaining agreement uh, by signing all these guys to 10 days when they're not eligible um, so they're like they don't know if Marcus Saul is going to be there in time they don't know yeah. if Malcolm Miller is going to get signed in time and stuff like this but as part of that we didn't know yet if Marcus Saul was going to be available for the Raptors. Um, so I was in New York, and I was with our friend James Herbert and Steve from Pub, Steve mm. Slykowski, and we went to the NBA store, and Steve will still claim this all the time, that he had a Marcus Gasol Raptors jersey before Marcus Gasol did because he went to the NBA oh, store wow. and got one, like, as soon as the Kudos. trade happened. Damn. Yeah. Kudos. He was early on that. Like, by yeah. the way, I was also at that game. As, as a fan. fan. Yeah. As part of AC Fan Flight. That nice. was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. literally, Air Canada was like, we need influencers to come on this trip. And like, I'm there. I was there. It was a one night stay in New York. I was able to bring my partner, and we were able to attend Marcus All's like Raptor debut. It's amazing. He came off the bench, threw a lot of great passes to Norman Powell, just set him up to score in ways that I felt like Norm was like, "Oh, basketball can be so simple if I just mm -hmm. like let you guide me." And that's the thing I loved about him too. He just he was able to guide other players. And uh, in that same trip, I also asked Matt Devlin as a fan because he didn't know who I was, and just as a fan. Why did you say Punjabi that one time <laughs> when you called Pejas Stojakovic's 
three for the Raptors, but uh, okay. the answer will probably have to wait on the other side of this break. <laughs> I think we really have to take a break. Also, Katie. just because like we're almost out of uh, out of time. Yeah, well, you know, we could always make time. But uh, Katie, I appreciate you for joining us on the program, and um, look forward to reading your book. Thanks. This guys. book that's torturing you. It's it is, but it, that's how you know it'll be good, right? Um, thank you for sure. having me. Of course. Um, okay, we're going to take this break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Willow. Uh, got Blake Murphy with me. We're going to go around the NBA relatively quickly. We'll see. With how quick... the quickness, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so first off, um, the Knicks. We already mentioned them a little bit, but just amazing vibes on the Knicks. Uh, Knicks fans last night chanting, we want Taj, we want Taj, we want Taj. Taj Gibson, once again, on a perpetual 10-day, he's just ready at any given moment for, uh, for you know, Tom Thibodeau, who he's played for at least five, six times now. Okay, and, so um, I, have yeah. a, I have a bit for you off of the, oh, Not okay. even a bit. I just, this is a semi-genuine take. In addition to the regular roster rules, mm. you should have a permanent spot that, like, it's not a roster spot. The player's not allowed to, like, practice with you and stuff like that throughout the year. It's it's purely emergency situations only. But you can go outside the cap to have your one guy in an emergency situation. And it has to be, like, someone with... So, like, the Pacers are doing it with James Johnson. They keep yeah. cutting him and re-signing him. The Knicks or whichever Tibbs team, it's obviously Taj Gibson. The Heat would have done this with Udonis Haslam over the years instead yeah. of having him on an actual contract. I think you should get, like, a emergency exemption team legend spot where mm. a guy could come back okay. and play that role I like that. Uh, just in emergency situations. I like that, yeah. I don't like, know who like the a, Raptors would be, but like a, DJ Wilson again? It's like a two-way spot for, for like, veterans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you just have them ready at the wedding. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that would be that for us. I suppose in a way that you can't that, start, you can't play eleven games in a row and be starting and yeah, be that. It, right. I guess Garrett would be the yeah Garrett the there guy. Ideally, he'd be someone with like ties to the org, like like the yeah, Taj right. and Tibbs thing. The so it'd be like Surge if we could just bring Surge yeah. in anytime we need. Yeah, or well, Bismack so. once he's done, you know. But yeah, I mean Bismack. Surge available. pops on a flight from Bayern back to back here. Hey, I mean Marcus All now. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the Knicks fans though they were chanting, "We want Taj, uh, Josh Hart." After the game said, um, I want to Taj too. What I play, 42 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to start begging for him. But uh, yeah, Josh Hart, um, just a great quote, as Tim Bontem said earlier. Josh Hart also got a 10.10 rebound, 10 assist, triple double. And I want to ask you, Blake, what should we call these triple doubles, these minimum triple doubles? All right, so I did a little research on this for you. Okay. So first I looked at triple doubles where players had fewer than 12 of each one. So not yeah. not the bare minimum, but pretty close to the minimum. 12, 12, and 12 around it. Jason Kidd is the all-time leader with yes. 10. Draymond has six of those. Mm -hmm. Magic Johnson had five just because he had so many triple doubles anyway. And then Rajon Rondo, Kyle Lowry, Nick Batum, and Russ Westbrook all had four of them. Okay. So my lean from that group is like, this feels like a Rondo. However, it does feel like a Rondo. then I looked and to see 10, 10, 10, exactly. You got mm. the bare minimum across the board. The only player to have ever done it twice is Andre Iguodala. Really? So maybe it's the Iggy, but also like. Yeah, it's hard it, to associate him with triple doubles. Yeah. But yeah. With like, uh, I don't know, being an angel investor, maybe, but but not I'm sure. I don't know. It feels kind of like the Rondo. Yeah. Andre Iguodala, that's how he speaks. It feels like a Quest Trade commercial, but that's yeah. a separate thing. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, for me, I feel like. This I just love ten point triple doubles. Yeah, you know what I mean. I love when a guy's already made so many contributions, and then they just need to get a bucket at the end, kind of thing, to to, to clinch the deal. That it just feels uh, very pure. I mean, I guess the opposite of this is like Ben Uzo triple double, but because he also kind of had a similar ish triple double, not ten 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 exactly. It's great research, man. I like that. Uh, yeah. Okay. I I the other answer actually came okay. up earlier in the show. And given that if we frame this as instead of being the minimum across the board, mm -hmm. it's just the points that you're struggling to get. Yeah. Could be the Ben Simmons. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I like that. I also like double doubles that don't involve points. I feel like that should be a special yeah. category. Um, just like impact, but not shooting. Impact. By the way, maybe it is just the Jason Kidd. So I just looked up. You yeah. had 10 rebounds and 10 assists, but didn't have 10 points. Mm -hmm. And Jason Kidd did that 25 times. No one else is even <laughs> close. Yeah. The Kitty uh, triple-double or the Kitty, uh, 
you know, uh, double double. Yeah. Um, what else happened in around the league? A right lot. Now? Uh, LeBron tweeted out just the hourglass emoji at two twenty six a.m. I guess earlier today in the in the morning, the wee hours. Uh, the the this comes on the heels of the Lakers losing in Atlanta. So this is not, by the way, a, a Western Conference kind of thing. They're literally in the East right now. Uh, the game ended at nine thirty. They lost to Atlanta. Gave up one hundred and thirty eight points to. Um, you know, the Hawks, is this, you know, we've seen LeBron make this kind of move before. So what do you think LeBron's trying to subtweet here? Man, I think that he, he, it just can't change this quickly all the time. Like Dude, this two, is every two year. games ago, they'd won five of seven, beat the Warriors in double overtime, beat Luka, beat Shea, mm -hmm. like less than a week. Like on Sunday, yeah. things were really, really good for the, like, it just can't change on a whim this quickly, I get it. It's the Rockets and the Hawks. That's a pretty ugly back-to-back -back loss to get blown out by both of those teams. And you've got the Celtics and Knicks ahead now. But I think this is just like, like, and you see the memes of like LeBron staring down Darvin Ham and stuff like that. There's always like little he subtle. He definitely roll his eyes looking at Darvin Ham's, yeah. uh, you know, whiteboard as he was trying up a play. Yeah. But, so I don't know yeah. what's there with the the hourglass. Maybe it's about his own time feeling like it's running out. Maybe it's Darvin Ham's time. Maybe it's some integrated betting thing or advertising thing that we don't even know about yet. I, I, mean, uh, I, don't, know. I don't know, man. But like you just three days ago, everything was so good and you'd won five of seven. Just like have a little bit of not even long, like short, medium term perspective. That's all. Yeah, I mean, it's like what we talked about with Katie, though. This is like yeah. what it's like, you know? It's it's a it's a get-it-done kind of business. There's yeah. no, no actual... And look, they're only it. a half game up on falling out of the plane entirely, so I get yeah. that it feels urgent and stuff like this, but... Um, they could I definitely make a move, though. I get it. Yeah. Um, last one here. Joel Embiid hopped on Men and Blazers, which is a longtime soccer podcast, and Joel Embiid said, quote, I'd rather be a football player than a basketball player. That's how much I love it. There's nothing close... To a bigger sport in the world nothing close to it i like the concept of a team in basketball you have two good players and you can win but in football as in soccer uh the team has to be together and i love this quote mostly because a even though my job is basketball i also love soccer more just as a sport purely um it's the one i grew up playing and yeah i wanted to ask you blake is, is there a sport that you love more than basketball not really no that's basketball's your favorite sport yeah. You like it when they dribble up and down the court kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. I mean, look, I'm going to get bounced to the Blue Jays soon enough. So uh, <laughs> don't don't clip this, you know. But, like, yeah, yeah like, yeah. I grew up, hockey was my entire life until yeah. uh, it was like, okay, you're not going to make junior. Like, yeah. I just wasn't good enough or whatever. And then, yeah, discovering a whole world outside of hockey and sports. Basketball is obviously where most of my mm. career is focused. And it's, yeah. uh, I think, you know, the most enjoyable Day to dance. I love baseball too. I just love yeah. sports, man. I don't. I don't need You're to. Just a sportsman. Uh, yeah. You're pro, a sportsman. Pro wrestling, whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Real sports, fake sports. You know, yeah. real sports bar and grill. Like you'll love all of it. But well, we forgot to mention the 905 jersey. Oh yeah. It's right behind us. If you get the shot on, under behind Blake, I mean th that jersey is so clean. 905 with the Lunar New Year, Year of the Dragon uh, pattern on the front. Uh, it, it just looks awesome. Credit to Pei Ying who was a designer of this. Uh, you get the CCYAA works, on the back as CCYA well. CCYAA as well. Um, yeah, just just really well done. And as an Asian person, I will be owning this momentarily. I mean, as Blake Murphy the one comes on the wall me. is yours. Uh, thank oh, you yeah? to the 905 for hooking this up. For oh, us. man, can't, you can't wait, man. I can't wait to drop three threes on a three of 20 shooting in my next run uh, wearing that uh, jersey. But uh, yeah, that does it for us today. I've been your host, Will Lou. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network brought to you by Campbell's New chunky spicy soup it's time to get fired up make sure you find the raptor show where we listen to podcasts and subscribe and please rate and review this show big thanks to our producers mark boffo and amit man our poor producer derek brand brandow uh, uh derek or jennifer rolnick david says jeremy for helping behind the scenes big thanks to our guests tim bontemps and katie heindel and we'll be back to talk raptors basketball tomorrow